We made this. Welcome to the Japan on Film Podcast. I'm your host, Perry Constantine, and welcoming a new guest today, and that is Jen Upton. Jen, how are you doing today? I'm great. Thank you for having me. Well, thanks for coming on. I was glad to uh, get your email. And uh, before we get started too much into today's movie, why don't you tell people a little bit about yourself? Um, I'm an American living in London. Um, grew up watching Japanese films. Um Worked in film and television in Los Angeles for many years. Uh, decided I wanted to go back to school and get my master's and study film. And in particular, study more Japanese film. So I ended up coming to London to do that because the people who wrote the books about Japanese cinema and taught the best courses were here in London. So oh, I, was I actually wasn't aware of that. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I did. A, I did, had a great year. I studied cinema. Edo period art and language for mm -hmm. a year. Got my master's, was supposed to stay for a year and a half, ended up staying for 12, and I'm still here. <laughs> so my first book is out now. It's called Japanese Cult Cinema, Films from the Second Golden Age, Selected Essays and Reviews. And a lot of the material in here comes from the research I did for my master's. And I either cut it down for the book or I expanded it. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also just some fun movie reviews, too, for for some movies that I just really like and want to share with people. Very cool. Yeah, um, I was glad to you mentioned that in your email. And uh, I have not picked up the book yet. I've been meaning to, but it's just my my TBR pile is That's okay. insane. That's um, okay. But uh, <laughs> one of the things I really liked about it when I got it is because I there I see so many of these um these uh these books uh, on cinema these academic books and i'm always like oh man i want to read these but it's like you know it costs like you know the half the price of a ps5 plus it's plus like you got to sacrifice a <laughs> kidney and and then it's only available in hardcover so then you got to pay the shipping cost to get it to japan because we don't offer it in ebook that's right so yeah so i was very <laughs> excited to see that yours is just you know you've got you've got the paperback and you've got the ebook yeah. and both of them are reasonably priced so so I'm definitely yes. looking forward to getting them for that from that aspect as well. Oh, thank you. I hope you enjoy it too, because um, I kept it. It's not a very long book, but it's part of it is quite in depth. Uh, mm -hmm. The middle part is quite academic, but like I said, there's a lot of fun stuff in here too. I wanted to balance it out yeah. and I didn't want it to be something you couldn't take on a plane. Mm -hmm. I wanted people to be able to put it in their bag and, Go, oh, then I'll download this movie and watch it when I'm traveling or, or, you know, I wanted it to be kind of an introduction almost and a bit of a deep dive on the same side. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, and I had a really good time learning how to publish and design mm -hmm. the cover. And, you know, it's just it's been a, it's been a learning curve. It's been quite a year. Yeah, so you went the self-publishing route then on that? I did. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I've been doing that a lot too. Yeah. yeah, that that for that um getting that first one done, that's uh that's <laughs> there's a big learning curve on that. I definitely know that from my oh, own yeah. experiences. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm gonna buy some of yours too. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um they're yes, not academic definitely. stuff, it's just, you know, pure pulp fiction stuff. So <laughs> as long as you don't mind that's that. That's all right. That's right um, up my alley. <laughs> thank good, great, awesome. Um, but uh so what are some of the movies that you you cover in that? Uh, there's a whole section on uh, J-horror. Well, the book itself focuses primarily on what I call the second golden age, which is the mm. 90s to the early 2000s. Because as we all know, the 60s, post-war era, was when Japan enjoyed a very fruitful period of time of filmmaking. Right. And films that were distributed globally and enjoyed great success and won awards and Venice Film Festival and all these different things. Then there's a bit of a lull in the 70s mm -hmm. and 80s, with the exception of Miyazaki um, coming up at that time in the 80s. And then in mm -hmm. the 90s, when Quentin Tarantino kind of shone the light, I think, uh, on some mm -hmm. of these films, IFC, Sundance Channel, 
all these channels started showing, you know, more and more of these films. I fortunately lived in a city where I could actually go to the theater and see some of these newer titles, which was amazing. Mm -hmm. But it did seem to me like the J-horror boom and also Takashi Miike, Beat Takeshi Kitano. Those guys were globally known and, mm -hmm. and it sort of was the second golden age for yeah, about 10, yeah. 12 years. Mm -hmm. So I focus on those titles from that period. Um, mm -hmm. I've got uh, a whole section on J-horror, a whole section on um, Takeshi Kitano. We've got Roaring into the 90s, and there's a few of the, the 90s Gamera films, the Shusuke Kaneko films, um, mm -hmm. and I love him, love him. Uh, I think he did. I think he did a great job. Um, and there's a few other just random fun movies that I saw during mm -hmm. that period that I felt don't get talked about enough. Mm -hmm. So they're in here. And the, the piece de resistance is Kyoshi Kurosawa's Cure, because that's the movie that made me want to learn more mm -hmm. and to dig deeper. And that's the film that, that probably gets the most ink in this book. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and I just, I just was literally mesmerized when I saw that film, mm -hmm. as you should be. Um, and that's the movie we're here to talk about. So, yeah, uh, there, there, absolutely. And before we get into that, there are a few other things I wanted to kind of piggyback off of what you said there. I mean, the the whole point about the you know, the, the, the 90, late nineties, the two thousands, that period being kind of like this second golden age. I agree completely with that. I mean, um, in mm -hmm. fact, just the other day I was talking about this in, um, one of my classes because we were talking about kind of like the influence of, uh, South Korean pop culture and how that's come up yeah. so massively in like the past 20 years. And, um, one of my students, uh, brought up this topic because he was kind of curious cause he's a university teacher and his, you know, all of his students are always really into South Korean, you know, K-pop or K-dramas. His wife loves, you know, Korean dramas and K-pop music. And he was just kind of mm -hmm. wondering, he's like, well, what, what is it about this stuff that is so appealing? And I was kind of curious about that myself and and i kind of compared it to and i've i've noticed kind of this trend you you maybe this might just be me you know completely throwing stuff off the off of uh out at random but you who's done actual more study about this than i am you can i can kind of i'd love to hear your take on this but my kind of theory is that um after the uh and i kind of likened it to what happened in japan because af in 97 after the um the the South Korean dictatorship ended. There was, that was the end of like the military censorship. And so it's like all these filmmakers and all these musicians, they just, you know, they just had the surge of content because now they could finally talk about this stuff that they've been bottling up inside. And I kind of like it too. I think that's kind of what happened in the fifties and the sixties with the first golden age of Japanese cinema, where under the, you know, the Imperial military dictatorship, they couldn't, you know, talk about any of this stuff. And then under the American occupation, it was, it was the same type of censorship. It was just different things that you couldn't talk about. And then, Correct. At, yeah. And then after that, they just, you know, it was just this explosion of creativity. They could finally talk about all this stuff that had been bottled up during the war years. I a hundred percent agree. I, I um, was just reading earlier today, getting ready for this podcast. Um, the guy who directed The Host and Creepy, Boon Joo Ho from South Korea, mm. his favorite movie is Cure. Oh, really? Okay. Yes. He said he thinks it's one of the greatest films ever made. Mm. And I have, I mean, obviously I agree. Obviously. But yeah. I have definitely seen that they had their boom came slightly after the second golden age of Japanese cinema. The Korean mm. stuff started to come in a little bit later and it's still kind of going strong now. Because yeah, Parasite yeah. won Best Picture. I mean, so. Yeah, on, uh, I do another show about superhero movies, and we just uh, we just recorded an episode on uh, Psychokinesis, which is uh, also directed by, uh, I can't remember his name, but he also directed Train to Busan. And, um, yeah, and Train to know, Busan was great. Yeah and, yeah, and Squid Game, you know, took the entire world by storm when that came out on Netflix yes, as well. Yes, that's true, um, too. Yeah. And it's. And uh, and I think and I liken a lot to what's hap what happened with the the second golden age of of Japanese movies too. Um, I think there's definitely some societal factors in that as well. With you know the yeah. you know you're coming on the ends of the first lost decade and moving into the second lost decade, and you know all yeah. the economic anxieties 
and uh, Japan kind of losing its status as the second largest economy and becoming overtaken by by China, not only in terms of economic status, but also in terms of trading status and partnership. And it seems like, you know, Japan kind of feels like it's, you know, losing its way a little bit. And um and a lot of those kinds of anxieties and fears, they they seem to be driving a lot of the the content in the the late '90s, early 2000s. I think. I totally agree. Yeah, and and to to a lesser degree, the last ten years. I don't know if you mm. saw Tokyo Sonata. Oh, I love also, Tokyo Sonata. Yes, yeah, yeah. So he's definitely he's hitting that hard right there. The whole economic, mm -hmm. you know, unemployed dad pretending to go to work every day and that's only 10 years old that movie 11 years yeah old? yeah yeah well so, yeah, yeah a lot of those i noticed it was funny because i i i teach a, a class in in uh in movies and one of my classes you know we do, do a lot of japanese movies it used to be all japanese movies but uh students uh are actually more interested in, in uh, american film so we kind of expanded the no. the breadth of it um <laughs> But uh, but yeah, one of the things that we that we talked about was kind of how like and I noticed how a lot of those movies from like the early two late 90s, early 2000s, a lot of the the themes they talk about there about like the the family alienation and like the mm -hmm. um, the uh, the economic anxieties, all that kind of stuff, the the gender discrepancies, all that kind of stuff. It, it's still happening today. It hasn't gone anywhere. Yeah, it hasn't. It hasn't really changed really unfortunately mm. it's been unfortunately like a 30, yes, yeah 30 year slump mm. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I, d I definitely there's definitely a parallel there for sure mm -hmm. yeah. between uh, korean I, film and japanese yeah yes uh now i want to go back a little bit and uh talk a little like like you said you know you'd kind of, um you kind of grew up watching japanese movies so what mm -hmm. what was that situation like like how did you get exposed to japanese movies what were kind of the first movies that introduced you to um to the to this uh i don't want to say genre but you know what i mean um well obviously i mean i it's funny because we just passed thanksgiving while we're recording this episode in in mm -hmm. thanksgiving on the east coast we had a TV channel called WOR and they showed Kaiju films for 24 hours. Mm -hmm. That was my introduction. <laughs> and then um, me being a Gen X kid, I think I saw a couple of the later Godzilla films in the cinema. They would have been dubbed, mm -hmm. but it would have been, you know, proper Japanese Godzilla in the movie theater as a kid. Right. And then I got a little older and I saw some of the samurai films. Just just randomly on cable, like Ron and Dreams and some of that stuff. Um, and then I kind of, I, did, I never really dipped out of it, but I kind of got into Italian cinema for a little while. Uh -huh. And Dario Argento and all that stuff. And then right. in the 90s, I dipped back in because I had a satellite dish. And I could get, I could, you know, get Sundance Channel, IFC, and I could get NHK. Mm -hmm. So, which, which a lot of people couldn't, and I could. And so I just, yeah, I, I really <laughs> jumped in and started watching not just the films, but the dramas and, you know, all that stuff. So I was familiar so, with all the actors and, and mm -hmm. you know, all that stuff. So. So when you said you were able to get NHK, that, w that stuff wasn't yeah. subtitled at all then, right? It was just pure Japanese language? You know what? It's a lot of it was in English. The oh, really? Feed that oh, okay. I got was in English. Some of it oh, wasn't, okay. but some of it had, did have subtitles, and then other mm -hmm. stuff was completely just in Japanese. And I kind of have to figure out, mm -hmm. you know, just what was going on because I hadn't studied Japanese at that point. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, I could watch all the sumo and all the dramas, and 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 I think we also got. Um, not just NHK, but what's that other channel that has like an eye for a with eyelashes for a logo? Oh, is um, it like Abemo or something like that? Or yeah, or we used to get that okay. for like three hours a night at okay. three in the morning <laughs> on our satellite for some reason in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. um, so that was pretty cool. Yeah. Okay. And every now and then they show films. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Awesome. So so it's yeah. basically like kaiju kind of stuff and then just kind of snowballed from there, basically. It kind of snowballed from there. But that's really all we had when I was a yeah. kid was, yeah. you know. <laughs> so. Well, I mean, yeah, I, I came up, uh, I, I came up 
very fortunately in that time period, I was university age when that late 90, early 2000s boom happened. So, uh, so I was mm-hmm. in the perfect spot because you had all these film distributors that were, you know, buying up the rights to these Japanese movies. They were releasing them out on uh, direct to DVD. Sometimes you'd get like yep. a, a small theatrical release and me uh, growing up in the, in the Chicago suburbs, it was very, you know, there was a there was like this small art house theater. There are the bunch of these like small little art house theaters where you could go and you could see these movies. So I could go and I could see Gozu in the theater. I could see uh, oh, Versus. Wow. I was able to see in the theater and all this other kind too. of stuff. I did yeah. too. Yeah, and that was fun. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, so yeah. it was very easy to to see them back then. And then when I when I started, and it's funny when I first came to Japan, my first thought was because I came here in uh, two thousand eight, was like, oh, I can. I could see all these movies now anytime I want. It's going to be so great. And then I found out that, well, no, none of them have subtitles when you get them here. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, like now it's not a problem because now I have um, now with uh, digital technology, I can get the subtitles <laughs> whenever they don't have them, but uh, uh, yeah. which is very frequently. But it's um, but back then, you know, that was like the very start of it. There was like no way to get the subtitles. It was before streaming. And uh, even like a lot of the the streaming services here, like Hulu in Japan, they don't have any subtitles for any of the Japanese movies or anything like that. So um, wow. my Japanese oh. is not good enough yet to where I don't need subtitles of some kind. It takes years. Doesn't yeah, it? It does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It takes a long time. People, it's funny because I studied for a year and I was barely at level one, like just mm-hmm. struggling, like <laughs> with the reading what? and writing, especially. <laughs> oh, yeah. I've been, I mean, I've been here 15 yeah. years and just it was, it was a lot easier in my first job because I had a lot of downtime at the office. I could study Japanese in my free time, but uh, I would go out on the weekends and at night, you know, and, you know, talk to people in town. But, you know, when you get in a relationship, uh, and you have kids, you, you don't you don't care about going out and talking to random strangers anymore. And t- no. finding time to study is even more difficult when you've got <laughs> two toddlers who are screaming for your attention. That's true. <laughs> <clears throat> um, so uh, we are talking today, like you mentioned, about uh, Cure. And um, like this was actually the first time I had seen this movie. Uh, I'd never seen it before. Oh, I wow. Have s- yes. Yeah. I have seen a bunch of other Kurosawa's other films, though. Um, I think yeah. my first introduction to him was Pulse. I think that was the first Pulse. movie. Most I people saw. Yeah. saw Pulse yeah. when it was released in the, in the States. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't see it in the theaters, but I did see it um, on DVD. It was also one of those instances where, you know, it, it seemed unique enough. It was part of that whole J-horror craze. And it was just very easy. Yeah. Just like, okay, go up on eBay or whatever. And you buy these bootleg DVDs for like, you know, five, 10 bucks. And that was how I yeah. built a lot of my early, uh, Japanese cinema collection. Um, and that movie amazed me. Like it was, it was, uh, such, it was so unique, even in, you know, compared to other J horror at the time, it was, you know, it was just like this completely different film. It's been so long since I've seen it, and um, it's been it's probably been like twenty years since I've seen it. But like I remember, my memories of it was I don't quite know what's happening here, but I'm very intrigued. <laughs> exactly, that's how I felt. I feel I feel that way about a lot of his films. Mm-hmm. To be perfectly honest, it's and I think he does that deliberately. If you've ever seen him interviewed, the interviewers sometimes ask him, so "What did you mean when mm-hmm. this?" happens in this movie and he'll just kind of get this sly little grin on his face and go it's whatever you think it means i think if i'm not mistaken i think david lynch also has a similar kind of uh approach to it which is why he doesn't do like commentaries or anything like that because he's he wants the audience to be the one to kind of draw their own conclusions from it which um yeah which is both a blessing and a curse i think it's cool that you want audiences to, to draw their own conclusions about it but at the same time you know I'm also curious about what you were thinking when you were making this too. <laughs> yes. A hundred percent. And, and pulse, it, a lot of his films are pretty bleak. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's yeah. not a happy, you know, not a happy ending. <laughs> no, no. no. Um, and it, it's funny. Like he, he came in through like kind of that J horror craze, but then he, he branched out in, in a way that not a lot of those directors did. Like there, there are different tracks. Some of those directors take, like you've got, like you mentioned Takashi Miike, who's, um output has just been unbelievably diverse like he's just he does yeah. everything i mean i remember when um uh the great yokai war came out and i'm just like wait takashi Miike directed a a, a family friendly movie what is this yes 
Um, but he's just yeah. kind of like run the whole gamut of it. Whereas uh, Kurosawa, you know, he started off with, you know, these these horror films. And then he branched out into doing these more serious dramas like uh, Tokyo Sonata and that kind of stuff. And um, and I've, I've only seen a few, I haven't seen a lot of his films. I've only seen a few. I've seen Tokyo Sonata, obviously. I've seen, you know, this one now, Pulse. And um, I think it was called Retribution. It was another. Mm hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, I recommend Charisma and Bright Future. Really okay. liked Bright Future. That was really good. There are a few other ones that I think he that I think I also seen of him, but I'm I'm blanking on their on their titles uh, yeah. uh, right now. But um, one of the things that I really uh, and and also like you know Tokyo Sonata going to, going on to that whole idea of like you know the bleak ending that's very much in the same kind of vein, and he does these very interesting things where hit his movies um uh, like he, he how do i explain it um he's very it, it it's, it's very disturbing but not in the way that you expect it to be disturbing if that makes yeah. any sense yeah it oh does. uh creepy that was the other one i was thinking of that was another one i saw that oh just, creepy yeah yeah i saw yeah. that in the cinema yeah yeah that one um i saw yeah. because of my wife we rented that uh about like I think two years ago, and um, that was another yeah, one that just yeah. kind of like blew me away. Um, yeah, yeah. This uh, one I saw the first time late at night. I came home from work and just it was it had already started, so I missed the beginning. Mm -hmm. So I had no idea what was happening. It just drew me in. So the next time it was on, I set my DVR, mm -hmm. and it was just like this is. Kira is such a it's such a deep dive it's a horror movie but it's also poli a police procedural mm -hmm. and it's it, people at the time compared it to seven i think it's 10 times better than seven mm -hmm. uh because seven is kind of it is what it is it's mm -hmm. really good mm -hmm. but this has more going on there's more subtext mm -hmm. like you say about japanese society about about right. repression mm -hmm. societal repression and you know marital repression and because takabe the, the the lead guy the the detective he's not a happy camper mm -hmm. he he just bottles it all up and gets on with his job and yeah. and and at the end even though it's a dark ending he's kind of freed mm -hmm. it's it's very much like oh <laughs> you know i mean i don't know are we doing spoilers we, we can do spoilers <laughs> yeah i mean uh, people have come to expect okay. that from this show because some of these movies it's yeah it's impossible to talk about them in depth without going into to spoiler territory. So, yeah, exactly. Um, so basically and, the, you want to go, you, you can talk about the plot of cure and then we'll talk about the ending. Yeah. Well, so we, um, you know, we don't go too much into, into plot in general here, but basically, you know, like you okay. said, it's, it's about these series of, you know, gruesome murders and, and the plot really, I think for this film, it's, it's not as important as I think what uh, Kurosawa was trying to say with what's happening in it. So like, I mean, on, on the surface, mm -hmm. it's just like you said, the plot, it's, you know, it's your basic, you know, thriller story, cop versus criminal cop versus uh, serial killer type of thing where you've got this, uh, this, you know, this guy who is using uh, hypnosis to try and induce uh, men to, to kill their wives. And, and, you know, and um, Takabe gets roped into this. He's got his own problems, like you mentioned, with with his wife, who is suffering from schizophrenia. She's often she's been in and out of house uh, with with doctors and she's often, you know, wandering around town and getting lost. And and um, kind of like the the stress he's feeling dealing with that, but also the stress he's feeling at, at work and all this kind of stuff. Um, and uh and some of the things that really kind of jumped out to me that I'd like to talk about here are, you know, some of the, let me bring up my notes here. Uh, there were some very big, like, um, this idea that Miyama, who is the, the, the killer in it, or, you mm -hmm. know, the one who's inducing the killers, uh, uh Mamiya, yes. sorry, mispronounced his name. Um, Mamiya, yeah. But he's he's got this very misogynistic uh, worldview, right? He he makes this, yeah. he says at one point that, um, uh, 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 women are lower than than men, or something along those lines. I can't remember the exact wording of it, but it was something like something along those lines. And and you see that in like the the types of victims he chooses, like this um, uh, 
the the first one is this um this man who is in a hotel room with a prostitute and he ends up smacking her with a with a with a pipe then what was interesting about this and this kind of goes to like this disturbing element of kurosawa's movies because it's not that it's a gruesome scene like it's not done in a gruesome way it's not filmed in a gruesome way i mean the act itself is horrifying but but also it's almost like this happy-go-lucky kind of soundtrack playing over the scene which is really kind of adds this this disturbing layer to it yeah 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 and i would also add to that um each of the killers the induced killers there's there's the natural elements are present in every one of the incidents. You have earth, mm-hmm. air, fire, and water. So the one guy has the pipe with the water that bursts out. And then mm-hmm. the doctor, the female doctor, has the water spilling out. And the other guy has a lighter. Mm-hmm. And then you hear wind in the empty building at the end of the film. Mm-hmm. So he's got all these things. And it's almost like he's saying the natural what's the word the, the natural position of a human being the natural disposition is to kill mm-hmm. the unrepressed id right you know it, it's yeah. there and mamiya is just bringing it out mm-hmm. it's what always it's what you always wanted to do you just couldn't do it before right yeah so yeah, there, yeah. there's this there's this very real sense of like you know society kind of uh society doesn't matter type of in his in his approach to the world um and uh there's at at one point um i, I want to talk to about you know uh takabe who's played by uh koji yakusho who you know um, mm-hmm. we were talking a little bit off mic before we started up and and i've mentioned many times on this sh- on this show that you know this guy has become one of my favorite actors uh since i started this show because yeah. i've seen so many different movies and and a lot of times when I'm watching these movies, I'm just like, wait a minute, is that 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 that's the same guy who was in, in this and this and this and this. And I, I've kind of likened him to Gary Oldman in a way, because I almost don't recognize him in every single in every single movie until like I go and check the credits or like there's one moment in the film when I'm like, oh, wait, there he is. I see him now. Yeah, I totally agree with you on that. Everything he's in, I love because he's in it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> not not just because he's in it, but even if it's like like uh, he did a movie with Kurosawa called Seance, which mm-hmm. it, it was a little on the slow side, but I thought, but he was so good in it and elevated it. Mm-hmm. You know, he he really is. He's a lot like Gary Oldman, and and he was in Shall We Dance. Shall, I was going to mention that it's one of my so, that's become one of my favorite movies. Like I I just love that yeah. movie and just like like the first time I saw it, it's kind of like oh you know it's you know it's kind of cute and everything. It's kind of funny. Yeah, but, yeah. But then when I started when I watched it again because I wanted to give my students something a little bit lighter after some of the more serious stuff we've been watching, and so I picked that one up kind of out of the blue, and then I rewatched it again. I'm like oh wait no no there are a lot of layers to this movie that I never realized before. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, and a big part of that is down to his performance and and it is kind of amazing how he, he plays these, you know, completely different characters in all these different movies. Like if you look at something like, uh, uh, world of Kaneko, which is like, you know, he's, you know, this very kind of like dark role. And, and then, you know, this one too, also, you know, this very kind of dark performance he does, but then compared to something like, shall we dance where he's, you know, this, you know, kind of somber, you know, hopeless romantic type. And it's just like unbelievable the 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 ways he seamlessly fits into all these different parts. Yeah, I totally agree. I need to see more of his films because I've only kind of seen the genre stuff. I haven't mm-hmm. really explored as much as I should with him. There was one he had I done. Do him. Yeah, there was a... Um... Uh, the Emperor in August. It was called. It was about like the uh, mm. the surrender of Japan, and he he plays a general in. I think I think it was a general who in that movie, and he does a really good job in that one as well. So that's another one I'd recommend. Mm. Um, yeah, and uh, but one of the things he says when he ha- he has this kind of breakdown when he's talking with uh, Mamiya, and he he basically yeah. just you know comes out and confesses the fact that he is. You know, he's so stressed out of, uh, about his wife and he's so angry at her and all that. And he and that she says, you know, she's become such a burden on me. And but then he also 
has the insight to turn it on himself as well, because he says, he says this thing that I wrote this down that he's, he's been taught to never show emotion. And yeah, that, that really jumped out to me because that's something that, you know, you see a lot of in not only Japanese society, but in a lot of societies in general, where this is idea that, you know, men are really constricted in the way we are allowed to express emotion. It's like, you know, we can only express anger or we can laugh and that's it. Like anything else, it becomes like, you know, it's, it's too womanly or whatever to, to, to show emotions like, like love or to, to be sad about things or anything like that. Everything else has to be bottled up inside. And I think that scene where he just kind of explodes is a really good illustration of what the dangers of that. Yeah, completely. And it's, it's like, that scene's great too, because it's not just about him. Mm-hmm. It's about all the other people that have been induced into killing right. before him. Yeah. So before he connects with Mamiya, it's like, mm-hmm. oh, but they never explain how Mamiya came to lose his own personality. They just show yeah. his his bookshelf and he studied Mesmer and he's a psychology student. He's done all these things, but he has no short term he, he has short-term memory loss. He cannot remember anything from minute to minute. Mm. So it now, never really I was, clearly... S- that's the thing I wasn't quite sure on. Like, is that... What's your take on that? Because my take is that he was faking the short-term memory loss. But now that you mentioned that, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I, was, I was curious what you thought about, how you interpreted that. I felt like he wasn't faking it. I felt like he something happened to him it's never really explicitly said that it's supernatural or not, Mm -hmm. but that something snapped when he was studying all this stuff, when he was learning Mm -hmm. hypnosis and all this. And maybe he himself is in a constant state of hypnosis. Mm -hmm. And we don't really know if Mamiya is even his real name. Like, I mean, it's sort of like, he doesn't really, you know, even when he's dying, he doesn't really remember a whole lot. It's, Mm -hmm. All he knows is that he has to do this. He's compelled to do this. It's almost like he's possessed by Mesmer. Or, right, or yeah. the, Japan, the first Japanese guy who studied Mesmer. Like mm-hmm. it's it's it, but it never goes there. It's not a possession film, but at the same time, there's like this little weird feeling that you get when you're watching it. Like, what's going on? Like it, yeah, it, who is it's this almost, guy? Where did he grow up? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it's very similar to to Ring and other J horror and that, and that there's this idea of almost like this kind of mimetic curse that's being passed down, and it's like this. Yes, it's like you know this whole idea of like madness being contagious or something like that. And um, uh, I mean, obviously, it's uh, I didn't read a supernatural meaning into it. I just think it's kind of more of a it's using that more of a societal metaphor as opposed to like a, a supernatural thing, like in in Ring. Um, yeah, you, you could do it in a supernatural reading of it too. I guess either way it works. Either way it works. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it, <clears throat> but also what I was thinking too is, I wonder if it's not even really important where Mamiya comes from because he's just kind of like the the catalyst for all this stuff that's yeah. Kind of bubbling I under think the that's surface. what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it, you know, in a lot of ways, I liken it to a lot of stuff, and you know. It's funny. I, I look at some of these these movies and notice that in some ways, you know, there's like a, a prophetic element to, to some of them because we see a lot of this kind of stuff. And also there was some influence, I believe, by the the sarin gas attacks. I know it had definitely influenced the title because the original yes. title of it was going to be Evangelist, but they changed it because of the, the sarin attacks. Um, but that that was something that was you know, cults were huge in, in Japan, even today, you know, they're still pretty big. And so there is this idea of like people searching for something, like they know there's something wrong in society. Something's not working the way it should. And so they're seeking out the, and they end up getting, you know, brainwashed or possessed or, or influenced. And what, and I liken it a lot to what's been happening in, in recent years in a lot of, uh, Western democracies with like the rise of the alt right and the resurgence of fascism. There's very much the same in a lot of the like, you know, anti LGBT rhetoric and all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of this idea of um, men losing their power and because they've been forced to bottle up their emotions so much. Now they're, they're kind of like, you know, exploding with, with anger. And that I think, 
And that seems to be kind of what's happening here in a lot of cases, too. Because like you said, after he has that explosion and, you know, we we it's never in. And I, I found out a lot of people said they weren't exactly 100 percent clear on this. Like, um, but we find out that his his wife is, you know, his wife gets murdered in the end in the hospital. And then he's just kind mm-hmm. of relaxed and sitting in that diner by himself. And he seems completely at ease. So it it's almost like this sense of now that that rage has been unleashed. Now there's this uh, this peace that comes over them. Yeah, I assume he killed her. I assume, too. Yeah. We never see- we don't see it and we're not sure when like was it in that scene where he explodes that he becomes under or under Mamiya's spell or was it later when he kills him and he puts his hand up and does the x mm-hmm. it's probably then when they're in the barn but he's <clears throat> sort what, of yeah. kind of he's kind of being seduced by him a little bit earlier right in the film so yeah it's well, I think really that's, interesting. yeah I think that's what that, you know, that anger explosion really kind of signifies. It's it shows that something in him is that Mamiya is breaking him. And and then, yeah, yeah I, my, I took it as when, Mom, when Mamiya does the X thing right before he dies, that that was, you know, completely infecting him. And that part, that's when it had been, you know, kind of passed on. Yeah, he's the new Mamiya. Mm-hmm. So I assume now he has the power to do it to other people. <laughs> right. Although they never show it. So, well, we get a hint of it at the end in that last scene with the diner. Uh, the, just a hint. Yeah. Yeah. yeah just, just that briefest hint. of hint. And uh, yeah, which is, yeah. is very much a kind of blink and you miss it moment. <laughs> yeah. Ex- it very much so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the other interesting one I thought was the doctor, the lady, the female doctor, mm-hmm. because he kind of goads her into all of these other doctors that are men. Mm-hmm. They don't respect you. And it's yeah. just, it's all there in her head. He's just pulling it out like a therapist would. Mm-hmm. And then she goes and does her thing. So, yeah. yeah, there's a lot of like, I think, I think the screenplay taps into, you hit the nail on the head. It's like a lot of stuff that people carry around mm-hmm. that maybe we didn't talk about prior to the pandemic, which is ironically contagious. Um, right. Yeah. Post pandemic, all this shit excuse me, is coming out. And, no, ab- and it's, yeah. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. There is, um, I, I don't know if you, you listen to it, uh, but Chris Hayes has a has a podcast called Why Is This Happening? And um, yeah, I think, uh, I think it was like maybe, uh, maybe it was, it's been, time, time is a flat circle to me now. I can never keep track of stuff. But um, it may have been like, it may have been last year, it may have been several months ago, but I remember he did this episode with, um, I think it was with a psychiatrist uh, uh, talking about, or a sociologist, I can't remember exactly, but, and it was kind of like this question of like, why is everybody so crazy after the pandemic? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I wonder that on a daily basis walking mm-hmm. through my neighborhood <laughs> so, <laughs> here in it, London. It, I mean, it does feel like there is, we are kind of reaching a, a kind of a tipping point in society because I think it's, yeah. and I think it is kind of like, you know, I mean, you know, Granted, I'm very biased on this because I am a I am a socialist, but I do feel like a lot of this is just kind of like these anxieties built up under the stress of late stage capitalism is just, you know, much like we saw happening in like the in in the 30s and the 40s with the rise with the first rise of fascism. A lot of that kind of stuff is, you know, that's come back now. We're like in we're like in the the peak of like a second gilded age now. And it's very much those same kind of and those same kind of problems are, are still there. And now we're at this point where it is all just bubbling up and people aren't able to recognize the causes. So they become, they end up becoming, you know, easy prey for people who are scapegoating it and saying like, you know, Oh, well, the problem is, is trans people or it's, it's women or it's, you yeah. know, it's whatever. And, <clears throat> or, or now, you know, now it's, it's, you know, right back to the old canary can of, you know, it's the Jews doing everything. So it's like, everything is yeah. coming back around. And, um, and I feel like there's a lot 100%. of that in that. I feel like Kurosawa could make a movie now about social media being the vector for the, the, the spreading of the crazy and mm-hmm. the disintegration of society. It's sort of like, like you said, Pulse was a bit prophetic. This was a bit, Cure was a bit prophetic. I've lost a couple of friends down the conspiracy theory rabbit mm-hmm. hole. Yeah. And we just don't talk anymore. Yeah. And it's sad. But it's oh, like. Oh, yeah, yeah what uh, what happened you, all of a sudden you turn around and you go, what what happened to that person mm-hmm. and, and yeah. that's how you feel when you watch 
cure. Like, what the hell happened? And even right. the people, after they commit the murder, they have no recollection of it and they don't know why they did it. Yeah, yeah. It was deep in there and it just came out. Well, you know, so, you see that happening with, with some of the people like, you know, from, from January 6th or something like that. Like, you know, there are still some who even after they've been arrested and in prison, they still, you know, they still cling hard to it. But there are some people who have just kind of like come out of it and it it's almost like they're coming out of a fog. And they're just kind of like, yeah. I don't know what happened to me. Um, and, and, you know, it's funny, you mentioned that he could do a film about social media. I mean, honestly, I think you could, if you just filmed some extra scenes for, from Pulse, you could release that pretty much intact yeah. and it would still, and it would completely make sense today. Completely. Yeah. I wonder, I wonder if he's been interviewed about all this, like where we are now. I'd be incredibly it, curious to, to get his take on a lot yeah. of this stuff. Like I, you know, totally. Yeah. You know, I the, every now and then I do know that there are some people in uh in, in these circles who do listen to this show. So if by any chance anyone is listening to this and if yeah. Kurosawa himself is listening to this, I would love to talk to him about this. So a hundred percent. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. He's definitely I think I mean they gave him a retrospect at the British Film Institute a while ago, um, where mm -hmm. they showed not all of his films, but they showed a few of his films and I think he's probably going to be remembered, you know, 20, 30 years from now as one of the most important of the second golden age. Oh, yeah. If not the the most important with with yeah. with Kitano, mm -hmm. you know, Kitano, too. I'd also had Cordeda in that, too. Yes, definitely. And and um, Mike, Mike, who again, yes, absolutely. Is, is, you know, <laughs> I mean, Mike is, you know, so. I I have endless appreciation for Mike because his movies were the ones that really kind of led me down this rabbit hole in the first place. It was, you know, watching audition yeah. and that kind of just and then from audition to then someone recommended Gozu and then and said like, Oh yeah, you yeah. liked audition. Well, that director has another movie that's in theaters now. And then from there it was just kind of like, I have to find everything this guy has made, which is a, which is yes. a, which is a steep hill to climb because he's done an insane amount of movies. I feel the same way. I feel like I look at the list and go, Oh, do I have time? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <To> commit. <laughs> Cause it is a commitment. <laughs> so yeah. Now you said you, um, you wrote a lot about a cure in your book. Um, mm -hmm, is, mm -hmm. are there any other things that you wanted to specifically mention that we haven't talked about so much? I kind of want to turn it over to you because one of the things I was curious about, and I, I meant to look this up, but I just, you know, kind of got pressed for time, but the Bluebeard connection, right? Because there's this, the scene in the opening where his wife is talking about Bluebeard and, and the story mm -hmm. of that. I was, I was wondering kind of like the thematic significance of that, because, you know, I've, I've heard the story of Bluebeard, but it was so long ago that it's very vague in my memory. That's interesting. I didn't, I didn't really um, tackle that at all when I did my research. I went for a semiotic analysis more. Okay. So I went through, you know, the, the third meaning, you know, and the obtuse and all that stuff and kind of looking at it from that point of view. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a really good question. You know, that that's worthy of another, another bout of research. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so for sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, but mostly I wrote about um, the earth, air, fire and water aspects mm -hmm. of what he was accomplishing mm -hmm. what he was trying to accomplish and what he did accomplish um okay because i don't think i've seen i hadn't seen when i wrote this that particular essay i hadn't seen a lot of people notice that so much mm -hmm. when they were reviewing the film or analyzing the film and it's it's right there i mean yeah it's, i mean I, I i'm one of them like i i mean granted i've only seen this one time so far but um yeah. now now when i watch it again i'm definitely going to be on the lookout for that but uh um, yeah but yeah, I definitely did not notice that uh, the first my my viewing on it. So that it's a very interesting. I I, uh, I think it, it was the second or third viewing. I went, oh, mm -hmm. he's got lots of stuff going on here. Like when you you know break down the shots and go, oh, okay, there's fire here, there's water here. Every killing mm -hmm. has a natural element behind it. Right. So it's which kind of yeah, like I said, it. He, I think what he was trying to say is that yeah, this is the natural thing for these people to do. Mm -hmm. So killing is as natural as air and fire and water. So yeah, I was also wondering about the the X itself, the cross mark, um, and, and also the title too, because you know the title, the movie is titled Cure, and mm -hmm. I'm 
do you have any thoughts about what the meaning of the of the title is? Yeah, I get into the in the book a little bit about I think the way I felt watching the film myself was that even though these people were hypnotized into killing, in a way they were cured. Okay. Of their of their you know, he's happy, like you said at the end in the diner. He's chilled out. He's the happiest he's been in a long time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's almost like releasing all that rage, all that angst, whatever it is that's going on. It cures these people in a way, even though they're mm. going to end up in jail. Right. You know, psychologically, they're better off. Mm. And there's an aspect of Mamiya that he feels like he's doing good, I think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't think I don't think Mamiya sees himself as a bad guy at all. I don't. No, that, no, abs- again, absolutely I don't, not. You know, well, and he seems he's... fascinated with Takabe because yeah. Takabe is the only one who opens up to him. <laughs> so it's it's really interesting. Which might be a reason why Taka- the effect is different on Takabe than it is on everybody else. Because everybody else, you know, they kind of like fall under Mamiya's spell, and then they and then they kill, and then that's. It's like it, it's over after that for them. And then, you know, they're just horrified by what they've done. They don't understand what it is. But Takabe, it seems like he understands. And that's why he kind of gains the ability. Yeah, he's he's much more self-reflexive mm-hmm. and more willing to admit that he's a mm-hmm. flawed human being. And and I think that's what fascinates me. He's like, oh, tell me more. Mm-hmm. There's you also know, this the line that time you see. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, it's the first time you see Mamiya kind of even act interested in one mm. of his one of his projects, as it were. Yeah. <laughs> so, and one of the things that interested me is um, there's one line I wrote down here that Mamiya says. Um, pretty sure he says. I think he says. I'm pretty sure he says it's Sakabe. He says like there is no real you, right? And I just like that. That kind of jumped out to me because I'm like wondering, like, what are they trying to say about that? Is it like this idea of who he really is is just kind of like these societal expectations on him? Like, you know, he's, you know, he's a cop, he's a husband, he has to keep those two worlds completely separate. And it's, you know, and again, going back to the whole idea of, you know, you're not allowed to express your true emotions. There's a lot of different ways you could read that, I think. What, what kind of was your take on that? My take on that was if it, Absolutely what you said. Um, but also like if if you were born in a different year, if you were born mm-hmm. in 1873 in France, you would be a completely different you. You would still look like you. Right. But you would be a completely different person. Mm-hmm. And so genetically you're the same. Psychologically, we are formed by our environment to a great mm-hmm. degree. Mm-hmm. And that includes the time period we're born, the place on earth we're born you know if you're born in a cold environment versus a tropical environment mm-hmm. you're going to do different things you're going to learn and eat different things and, and socioeconomic environments and all that yeah all of that so mm-hmm. really yeah each of us is only who we are because of the exact moment we're born right so I think that's kind of what maybe I read too much into it. I don't know. No, no, that, it, I, I, that's making a lot of that's re, that's making a lot of sense to me now hearing you say that because it it also fits because you know, like like we said, Mamiya he has no short term memory, so he doesn't really have a real personality as a result of that. And and right. then you look at these and you know these people that he brainwashes, you know, like we like we've said, they just it's like they. They complete. They change into a completely different person, and when they come out of it, they, it's almost like these killings were done by someone else, like a complete stranger. Like they don't recognize themselves in those murders. Yeah, yeah, and that's also a bit prophetic too, because in the last couple of years, I've noticed a lot more attention being paid to dementia. Mm-hmm. And you know, people like Bruce Willis, they they're younger when they're getting it now, and that's what that's what it is if you've ever talked to a person who has dementia Mm -hmm. it's like they're not there that person that you know is gone and then all of a sudden they'll snap out of it and they're there for a few minutes Mm -hmm. and you can see it in the eyes and then all of a sudden it just goes blank again yeah so it's it's you know the brain is the brain yeah yeah. but 
Um, I've never experienced that firsthand, but it's a similar thing too with like uh, Alzheimer's patients from what I've heard from, from people who have uh, family members who who have suffered from Alzheimer's. They, they describe it exactly like that. It's like they're, they're completely gone and there might, there's these brief moments when they come back and then they're gone again. Yeah. And they're, they're the the people that I've been around who've had it, their long-term memory is spot on. Mm-hmm. sharp as attack they can yeah. remember stuff from 1945 but they can't remember what they had for lunch you know what, uh you're, you're saying so, a lot of this because you know this is uh this is getting a little bit personal here my brother passed away recently and um one of the things that oh, struck so me sorry. In, oh thank you but uh but one of the things that struck me in some of our you know last times we talked to him because um you know we went back to the states in over the summer and he was supposed to come down uh, and, and stop by for like my for my wife and I were kind of our, we had our wedding ceremony at that point because that was the first time we were able to <laughs> with the pandemic and mm-hmm. and two kids being born and everything. Um, but and I had talked to him like the night I arrived, I talked to him on the phone and, you know, and then like um, I think it was like a week later, he called my sister and he had asked if I was in town yet. And it's like. Yeah, you talked to him last week when he arrived. So there was that kind of stuff. And just like when I was talking to him in some other places, like there was this constant repetition in a lot of what he was saying. Like the like conversation was going, he was like telling me stuff he had just he had just finished telling me five minutes ago. But you're right. When he talked about like long term memory stuff, like stuff that happened decades ago, he it was spot on. He knew he could, it was sharp as a tack. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's just so interesting. I'm not sure how or why Kurosawa even came comes up with the ideas that he does. Mm-hmm. It's it seems like he has an acute awareness of of not only the filmmaking process itself, which he's technically a genius, but right. what's going on in society, not just in Japan but globally, just mm-hmm. the human condition, which is what right. makes a great filmmaker. Yeah. Um, and the other thing I wanted to talk about was the, the symbol, right? The kind of like X mark, because it's, mm, yeah. it's interesting because I'm looking at the different posters and even in the posters, it's depicted in different ways. And sometimes it's depicted more as like a standard X. Other times it's slanted and it's almost like it's a, it's a, uh, a skewed cross. I was wondering if you had any thoughts about the, any significance behind the, the, the symbol. Given that the original f- title was the was it the evangelist evangelist yeah that would have changed that symbology mm-hmm. it's interesting just by changing one word he changed a lot of the meaning <laughs> isn't yeah. that really interesting um, I kind of the first time I saw it I thought it's kind of like solving for X X can be anything you oh, want oh that's a good point yeah I hadn't thought about that um, but yeah in, that's in a math very good point too. I mean, it, um, because when Twitter turned into X, the first thing I thought of was this film. Like, oh my There's God. There's another prophetic aspect of it. Jesus. This oh is God. not good. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is really not good. And I wondered, did Elon Musk see this film? Because this is messed up. <laughs> I, it's I do not you credit want it to be. Yeah, I do not credit that. <laughs> that sociopath with having any sort of deep insight into that. I think he just, no, I, he's just obsessed with the letter either. X. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's so, but, but honestly, it is literally Saul for X. It's mm-hmm. whatever you want it to be. That's, so. that's a good point. Yeah. Um, my, what I kept going back to was when I was in university, I had taken, um, uh, yeah, I, I had, I, I ended up taking a, a class in, um, medieval literature at one point, And then I also took a class in, in feminist literature and it was the same professor. And she was kind of like, um, and medieval literature was kind of like her, her specialty. And so, mm. So even like the feminist class, we we spent a lot of time on like a lot of med- feminist readings of medieval literature and and a lot of it, like, you know, the stuff from like the church fathers and all this kind of stuff. It was, you know, unbelievably misogynistic shit. Oh, yeah. And yeah. And so I, I, I felt like a, I, watching this movie and seeing that symbol, it, it was bringing back a lot of memories of those discussions from from that class and like that kind of. So I think and I think, yeah, if it was if this movie was called Evangelist, I think that that cross would have a completely different meaning as well. I agree with you on that. So I took it as being like, and, and you know, the cross could be a stand in for a lot of different things. It doesn't necessarily 
have to represent straight on Christianity, but it could also just be, you know, the influence of, of Western society in general, that could be a factor in there with, yeah. you know, cause, um, especially on, in terms of like, you know, male psychology and like male behavior, Western society has a massive influence on that in, in Japan, especially from like the Meiji era on, I think. Totally. Yeah. And, and the fact that he's, Mamiya was studying and obsessed with Mesmer. Right. Yeah. You know, so yeah, it's like Western influences coming, you know, and then I guess if he, if he wanted to call it the evangelist, yeah, then Mamiya would be the spreader of this message, this, this, I guess you could call it a message. Well, I mean, even, you know, you early know. psychology too, it had roots in very strong misogyny with, with Freud and all that kind of oh, stuff, yeah. like blaming everything on your mother. So exactly. Yeah. It, I don't think it goes quite there, this film. Um, but yeah, the female characters, there's only really two. I mean, there's the doctor and then there's Mrs. Takabe and neither of them right. are very important characters. It's, it's, <laughs> you know, it's, really all about takabe it is yeah yeah so yeah yeah so um and the fact that his wife has an illness makes her devoid of a personality her her personality is that she's ill right well and also too like you know it you know historically speaking the term hysteria came from the fact that you know it, it was called like it was considered a woman's disease because you know women yeah. you know um yeah so, so so yeah that that whole aspect of it as well so, so yeah, there's a lot of that too like this whole idea of especially too like you know the fact that he's saying like you know my wife is a burden on me and all that kind of stuff but but yeah. really you know it's like well dude why did she go crazy like you know what you know, were, what was the situation in your life where you, because, you know, I, I'd imagine, you know, a situation where, you know, a woman is, you know, a housewife or whatnot, and she's being ignored by her husband is that's, that's enough to, to make, to make you go, make you snap. And to, and to live under society's expectations of maybe she was educated and had a good job until she re- married Takabe and then gave it all up, which is, that still oh, happens yeah. in Com- it, common you know. common trend like as soon as a as soon as a woman in japan yeah. gets married the first question they start asking her at work is like when are you going to quit your job yeah yeah it's it, and they don't have children so we don't we don't really know her at all we don't know who she was before right or who yeah. they were as a couple well i mean there was that so, one scene and i don't know um, it was late at night, so I may have been misreading this, but wasn't she like listening to like language tapes or something at one point in the beginning? Yeah, 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 yeah. And she obviously is well read. Mm-hmm. You know, she seems to like literature. But right. other than that, you really don't know her. Like, where is she from? Is she from the same city? Is she, how did they meet? Right. Yeah. There's, there's nothing. It's just right. all about her illness. Yeah. So. And the, know, but there is that sense there of, that the the knowledge of like Bluebeard and all that and like listening to language tapes that you are dealing with someone who does have an educated background of some kind. Yes. Um, so yes. And then so is this kind of sense of which you see a lot in Japan of like this you know this woman goes through all this trouble of educating herself and all that and now it's just she's just sitting at home waiting for her husband to come home. Yeah turning the the washing machine on yeah, over and yeah. over and over again which was mm. definitely symbolic oh yeah, it was, yeah. <laughs> he'd turn it off she'd turn it back on and it was like you're supposed to assume it's because she's she doesn't maybe remember she did it but i think it's almost like robotic activity she's done it mm. so many times right that this is what she thinks she has to keep doing yeah yeah absolutely. so i mean of of all the characters I have a lot of sympathy for Takabe, but for her, definitely, because she did not deserve to die. No, no. <laughs> she, she was she needed to be hospitalized and treated. Well, know? that was an, that's another thing, too, is just like the way that Japan, Japanese society treats mental illness. Right. It's just kind of like this idea yeah. of I mean, I do in some ways, Takabe is a little bit more forward thinking than a lot of people in, in Japan in this way, because he does, you know, admit that, you know, getting her this doctor has helped her, has made her better. He mm. does. But a lot of times it's just kind of like we ignore the problem or when it gets too bad, then we just lock them away in a in a mental hospital and we, and we just pretend they don't exist anymore. That happens a lot here. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's. 
It's very sad. That's the sad part of the movie is, mm -hmm. you know, in a way, her death cured her. So yeah, she's cured yeah. too in a weird way. She She's dead. She doesn't have to suffer anymore. He doesn't have to suffer anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of a weird... It's You'll see this a bit in Bright Future, his other film. There's the dark part of the ending, but there's also this odd, like you said, like odd upbeatness. Mm-hmm this was inevitable and it kind of worked out <laughs> so yeah, yeah even though it's dark mm -hmm. you know it's it's he has a tendency to do that in his films where there's like i shouldn't feel happy for takabe but i kind of do right. <laughs> you know at the end and and yeah we there's also this kind of sense of like this um you know the the cure being worse than the disease type of thing where it's you know this is the this is the best cure we can come up with given what society is giving us access to because society is not willing to make the changes that it needs to, to prevent these kinds of problems from happening in the first place. Yeah. And it's just going to continue with him. Mm -hmm. And then eventually you assume after a few years, he'll find somebody else to pass it on to. Right. And this is never going to stop. Exactly. So, yeah. you know, I would have liked to have seen a sequel to be honest. I'm not a huge fan of sequels, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I don't know. The, the continuing adventures. Yeah. Know, you know, I'm of, I, I think it'd be interesting. I'm of two minds of that. Like, I think it would be interesting, like you said, but also I, I think of the ring and how perfect that ending was and, yeah. and then how, then we got a sequel to it and like, a, it just, it just did. And then you realize like, no, the, the way that it ended was actually just fine. We didn't need to hear it. It was that. fine. Yeah. Yeah. The books were a bit different. I don't know if you read the books, but no, no, I have not. Yeah. Yeah. The books, I, I cover that in my book too. The, the things that were changed in the adaptation process. Okay. Right, that's so, so that's and a lot of it out. has to do. Yeah. A lot of it has to do with um, not to get too deep into it, but a lot of what you're saying about feminist theory and stuff like mm. that, it's the books and the movies are completely different. Oh, okay. That's in that respect. So you probably like the books if you read the books. Yeah. I'll, I'll have to, I'll have to check those out. I'll have to look at, look into those. Um, and I'll have to look into, into yeah. your book as well to get those, those readings on it. Cause I did notice yeah. that there the was English translations. Um, yeah, I did notice good. the English translations. Yeah, because one of the things I noticed about that, and you know, we're getting into moving out of cure territory now, so we'll. Be yeah, I know, I know. This, but <laughs> but, uh, but I did want to. But we covered, um, and I think it was our first episode with uh, with with the new guest format is um, with uh, we covered the the Ring movies, the the first, the original Japanese one, and the American adaptation. One of the things I noticed watching them back to back was just how much the American version really made a. A, 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 they they took they did a lot of care in adapting the story to an American context compared to to some of the other J horror remakes where they just kind of like took the story and just plopped it into an American city. Yeah, but there they made yeah. a lot. There was like a solid effort, and you know it's and one of the things I did notice was like the treatment of women in each version. Like in the in the Japanese version, you know the the main character she becomes almost like a supporting character in her own story with the ex husband, but in mm -hmm. the in the American version, you know, Naomi Watts' character, she's, you know, she stays firm and strong pretty much throughout. And she remains yeah. like the focal point yeah. of that story. Yeah. Interesting is the character in the books is a man. The reporter character male. is a man? Oh, okay. Yeah. And he has a little girl instead of a little boy. Ah, that's interesting. It's really interesting. Yeah. So go ahead and read those books because, and the books are very different from the films in terms of the sequels and stuff, they're pretty, they're really different, but you will enjoy them. Just, I can tell from talking to you. Was there any final things you wanted to say about cure or anything that we did not touch on so mm. far? If you haven't seen it, see it. Okay. So it's a good <laughs> point to end on. Um, yeah. So Jen, it was a pleasure having you on. Why don't you tell people uh, you. Where, where they can find your book, where they can find you on the web, anything like that. Yeah, you can find my book on Amazon or Barnes and Noble, um, ebook version, the print version. I also have an Etsy shop where you can get it directly from the source. Um, my website is jenuptonwriter.com. I also do ghostwriting. If anybody needs a writer or a proofreader or an editor, call me. Um, and I'm also on uh, occasionally a few times a year, I am on the Groovy Doom Drive In Asylum youtube channel watching scary movies with their with the hosts 
Okay, awesome. We'll have uh, we'll have links to all that stuff in the show notes, so please make sure to uh, to check out that stuff. Um, as for us, japanonfilm.com is the website, and we are Japan on Film on the socials. That's mostly uh, Instagram, Twitter, or technically not so much Twitter these days. We're technically there, but I don't, as previously mentioned, he's a psychopath, so I try not to spend too much time on there. Um, but uh, Blue Sky threads on both of those under Japan on Film, so you can find us uh, there. Uh, this show is also part of the We Made This Network, so please you know support them. Check out the other great shows on the network. And uh, on a personal note, my comic book, uh, Paragons of Earth, if you're interested in superheroes or public domain stuff, that it should be out now by the time you're listening to this. And you can find that at crowdfunder.com slash Paragons Comic. That's Crowdfunder, no E in crowdfunder.com slash paragons comic. There'll also be a link to that in the show notes. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll talk to you next time. The Japan on Film podcast is produced by me, Perry Constantine, in conjunction with the We Made This podcast network. Visit japanonfilm.com for show notes, episodes, merchandise, and information about being a guest yourself. You can also reach out to me on the website's contact form if you have questions or comments about Japanese movies or the show itself. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram, at JapanOnFilm. If you'd like to help support the show, you can donate at JapanOnFilm.com, WeMadeThisNetwork.com, or by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can find links with information about each guest and join the discussion on the We Made This Discord in the show notes of each episode. And now, listen to hear what's coming up next on the We Made This Network. Do you like crime stories, books, and people talking about those things? Then you should check out the Red and Buried podcast. A murder? A murder. Oh. I'm Frankie. And I'm Sarah. And in each episode, we pick a different theme and surprise and delight each other with a cheeky little review. As you started reading, I was like, this sounds like a romance novel. And then you got to monstrous crime. Yay, there it is. That's what we're here for, isn't it? We're also regularly visited by many talented and best-selling authors, including the likes of Chris Whitaker, Elizabeth with Haynes, Emma Stonex, Fiona Cummins, and a whole lot more. I li- obviously listened to the podcast, and I listened to you interviewing Chris Whitaker, and I thought, oh, hey, that sounds like a really good fun podcast. <laughs> <laughs> if you like your crime books with a big side of silly, this is the podcast for you. Listen to the Red and Buried podcast right now, brought to you by the We Made This Network. Three rings for the elven kings under the sky. Seven for the dwarf lords in their halls of stone. Nine for mortal men doomed to die. One for the Dark Lord on his dark throne. In the land of Mordor, where the shadows lie. Welcome to One Rules Them All, a Lord of the Rings podcast on the We Made This podcast network. Myself, Luke Winch, and my co-host, Baz Greenland, will be exploring the new Amazon Prime series, The Rings of Power. Week by week, we shall be analysing each episode with a foray of guests. We have also been revisiting the Peter Jackson films and looking at them from a new perspective. So join us every week as we discuss the world of Tolkien and the rings of power. One podcast to rule them all. One podcast to find them. One podcast to bring them all. And on the We Made This Network, bind them.